All right, so as we, as we think about this passage that was read for us, there's, a, there's actually three different parables that Jesus tells here in Luke chapter 15. And the parables are, they've been described in a number of ways what a parable is. The literal meaning of the word parable is something that is laid alongside. And you have three of them in this passage, but each of them are things that might describe a familiar story. That is, and some have, I don't know who came up with the phrase, but I've heard it expressed that it's an, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, something along that line. That's not the only kind of parables that existed in that day, but at least biblically that's what we're talking about. There's some message that's coming across, but it's very familiar description of events and things that they knew about. And, and this would use those common events to teach a spiritual truth. And usually there's one primary meaning. There may be secondary meanings. I believe in this case, in the case of the prodigal son that we're going to look at, and that's what I want to focus on, the third of these, of these three parables here, this, this actually has three primary points that are made. And I want us to focus in on those as we go through it. But I'd like you to open your Bibles to Luke, the 15th chapter, if you don't have them open already. And we're going to continue reading this, this uh, parable as we find what Jesus is, as he's responding to these people and their reaction to him meeting with the ones that were known sinners, that were known as living lives in the departure from what God would have them to live. In verse, in verse 11, and if you want to use a pew Bible, if you didn't bring your own, you can find it on page 733. That pew Bible should be on the back of the pew in front of you. You may have to ask the person next to you to pass you one. That's fine. Go ahead. All right. We're going to read quite a bit. So go ahead and pick that up. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. He said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them to... And so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now some of the versions say wasteful living, which is of course the meaning of that. He says, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed, feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now we're going to stop right there for a moment and just notice a number of the things that are said about this. So he takes his share of his inheritance and he travels to this distant country. And it's obviously a place away because of the fact that there's swine that they're feeding, which were considered unclean animals to the Jews, of course. But he's going to, instead of being wise with whatever he's been given, he wastes it. He wastes it with loose living. And we might say that at some point, at least as he's describing his situation, he kind of hit the bottom. <laughs> and many times that's what it takes. Somebody has to sometimes hit a point, they hit rock bottom, they feel like they can't fall any lower, and they come to themselves, and that's really what he did. I mean, the fact of him wanting to eat pig slop, that's pretty much the lowest of the low to the Jewish audience that he's speaking to. You just, not only is he, and I don't know if you've been around pigs, but it's kind of amazing what they eat. I, we raised some pigs at one time, and I had this 55-gallon barrel that we'd put this grain and stuff in, and we let it kind of ferment a little bit. It got where it was, uh, uh, well, it was pig slop, you know. But boy, those pigs loved it, you know. We'd scoop it out of there and... And uh, just, they, they'd go crazy for it, you know. But to say that he's wishing he could eat what he's feeding the pigs, I think has an exceptionally low description to the Jewish audience that he's talking. But maybe one of the most important things is that it says that he came to himself. When it says he came to himself, we're saying he really got the picture of where he was at. 
And I think that's one of those circumstances that sometimes we find ways to deceive ourselves in not really realizing where we're at. We make things feel better. We try to take away some of the consequences from some of the choices we're making. We compare ourselves to other people. Or sometimes we just don't even open our eyes to realize how much we need God. We think we can handle things all on ourselves. And really what we say when he came to himself, the first thing is that we notice that he humbled himself. That is that he realized he's not even worthy to be called a son anymore. Yes, he was his father's son, but he doesn't consider himself worthy to be even called that anymore. He, he knows that the choices that he's made has put him in opposition to where he was with his father. And so he reasons even, he says, you know what, I'm even better as a servant in my father's house I'll live better as a servant than I will out here. And that's what he's determined that he's going to do. But I want to talk a little bit more about this description of him being prodigal. And maybe it's one of those things I would say that a large percentage of people, if they hear the, hear the term prodigal, they would say, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what prodigal means. They might hear, have heard of the prodigal son. They might even be able to say, oh yeah, the prodigal son, that's the one that kind of is the outcast of the family. He's the black sheep of the family. But maybe still not be able to know exactly what it means. And as some of the translations have translated it, it means wasteful. It's saying this, the way he's living is wasteful. He's, he's wasting his inheritance, but he's wasting his time. He's wasting his life. And I think sometimes as we, as we think about that idea of there being a a wasteful life, we could say there's a lot of ways that can apply. Not just to somebody who goes out as his brother accuses him and says he spent all this money on prostitutes and, and, and getting drunk. And we can certainly think of a number of ways that we would say, well, that's obviously wasting money on an immoral things. But how, much, how many other things that we would say that that idea of wasting things can just be a matter of us not really taking advantage of the opportunities that we have in helping people in the way God wants us to. There may be ways in which we think about our life, the way we've used our time, the way we've used our energies. I don't know if you've ever reached this point and just thought, well, you know, I really wish I'd have made some other choices. I wish I had done some things differently. I wish I had recognized the opportunity that I had. Sometimes this comes even in times when we lose somebody and we think about, oh, I wish I had said this. I wasted that time that I had with them. I didn't know that was going to be my last time with them. Or maybe it's sometimes that we think about later on that we had an opportunity to reach somebody with the gospel. Maybe we went to work with them every day. Maybe we went to school with them every day. Maybe we had some kind of a business relationship with them or just a neighborhood rep, rep, uh, relationship with them. They're, in, they're our neighbors. And then we think, you know, I've wasted this opportunity that I had to teach them the gospel of Christ, to introduce them to Jesus. So in, in some ways, we've all wasted what we've received from God. I mean, we can think about maybe productive ways that would relate to the world, but being productive for God how, how have we been? There is great value in coming to our senses, to coming to ourselves, to realizing this is what really matters. These are the things that are really important. And, and it's one of those things that can be absolutely life-changing, just like it was for him in this, in this story, this description here. But it also involves the second part of that, which is the humility that he had. Not, not just coming to ourself and then, and then not really realizing where we are with God, but starting to think maybe too highly of ourselves that, as we, than we should, but rather to humbly recognize what an undeserving privilege it is to serve God. You know, to realize that a servant in God's house is really better than doing our own thing in the world. And it is something that you find the godly men of the Bible longing for, as David expressed 
His desire, two things that I ask of the Lord, that I may dwell in His house and that I may gaze upon His beauty, that I can recognize and see God for who He is. And when we think about what we can do for God and all the other things that we might do, all the other service that we might offer, all the other activities we might be involved in, which has more lasting value? What we're doing that's only going to be part of this life or what's going to be, bring people to a relationship with God and give them eternal blessings? I don't have to answer that question, do I? <laughs> we know what really has more value. And really our own ability, our own opportunity to be part of what is God's, of God's service, should be seen as a wonderful blessing that all of us have. Let's go back to Luke 15, though, and look what else happens here. here is, here's what happens with the man himself as he comes to himself and he's, and he's humbling himself and he's returning to the Father. But then we have what's described with the Father beginning in verse 20. He arose and came to his Father, but when he was still a great way off, his Father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The Son said to him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here. Kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. So this is the story's representation of what he said in the other, at the end of the other parables about there being more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 that need no repentance. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't ignore that there is the need for repentance. That the man himself had to make a decision about whether he was going to return to his father or not. But notice the reaction of the father is one indeed of great rejoicing. It's not, wait a minute, I gave you your inheritance, look at how you wasted it, what makes you think I'm going to let you back in my house? That wasn't the reaction the father had. And it's not the reaction that God has either. We notice he sees him coming. He sees that the, the young man is now returning to him. God is aware not only as we're making the effort to return to Him, He knows what's going on in our mind and in our heart when we come to ourselves and when we humble ourselves. But the man didn't come demanding things, he came humbly to God, or excuse me, to His Father, just like we need to come to God humbly and recognize that He doesn't owe us anything. But as we see him returning to the father, the father runs to meet him. He hugs and kisses him. Can you imagine what's going on in this story? I know it's a story. It's a, it's a parable. But if that situation, and it probably has happened, just like the parables were often things that happened many times. But what's happening in the, would happen in, that, in the mind of the son when he thinks he's going to come on his hands and his knees begging. He's already determined, I'm not going to ask him to treat me like a son. I just want him to let me come back and be a servant in his house. He's already got his speech rehearsed. That's what, he's, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to tell him, I just want to be a servant in your house. I'm not worthy to be called a son. Please let me just be a servant. Because I want to be in your house. That's where I want to be. And now to have him run to meet him, to hug him, to kiss him, to, to, call, to kill the fatted calf, to call all the people together, to have this great rejoicing. I think it's important, I do think it's very important that we, that we emphasize to new converts, to people who've wandered away and returned, that though we can't hear it, there's great rejoicing in heaven. And, and maybe, maybe we are or are not seeing it in the people around us. But we can be confident that that's what's going on when we return to God. And, he, and, the, and when we think about the return here of the son to the father, he welcomes him as his son. 
He doesn't delegate him to say, okay, yeah, you can come back, but you're going to be at the bottom of the totem pole in the household servants. You're starting off at minimum wage. <laughs> now he welcomes him as a son. And he celebrates his return. And we can be confident that God is always happy when a sinner repents. And in fact, that's the statement that keeps coming in all of these parables. There is more rejoicing over one sinner who repents. We also learn some things when we think about this in relation to God, that God gives blessings to those who neither deserve and sometimes never do appreciate. You know, when Jesus made the statement, he makes his son to, son to rise on the just and the unjust. He sends rain to the just and the unjust. <laughs> People benefit from God's blessings all the time. Even if they don't believe in him. Everyone has. Life itself and I know there's some people who've had some very difficult situations that they've been born into or raised in or had happened to them. But even they have had some good things that have come from God. That they didn't do anything to deserve it. And rather, whether or not they ever appreciate that, it's still true. And it's also true that they have the blessing of an opportunity to benefit from what Jesus did for them. Whether they ever do or not. It's there for them. Because of all the blessings that God has given us. The blessing of salvation. The ability of us to, re to return to God is the greatest of the blessings. And God is ready with open arms to receive those who return to Him. I think that's the picture that Jesus is really emphasizing to those that have questions about his own participation. We recognize that God loves us even when we have distanced ourselves from him. Yes, even when we have. It doesn't mean he approves of what we're doing. It doesn't mean that he doesn't require repentance. But it does mean that he cares for us. Even when we've deliberately wasted what he's given us and turned away from him, he still loves us. And recognizing that we do serve a God of love. Look at these verses in Romans chapter 6, beginning there in verse, um, excuse me, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. That's on page 788 if you're using a pew Bible. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now there's, a, there's some interesting words that are important to make note of. And that is the word enemy and the word reconciliation. That when we think about being alienated from God, that we're made enemies of God. That's where we are because of sin. There's only two sides. <laughs> we're either with God or we're against Him. And, and if we've alienated ourselves from God, we've made ourselves an enemy of God, then we need to be reconciled, brought back to Him. But in the, even before that happens, what He's telling us is that God loves us. He doesn't, again, doesn't mean He's approving of the choices that we've made. He doesn't approve of the, the way we're living. He doesn't approve of the things that, that may be in opposition to Him. But He is saying He still loves us. I think this is also giving us a reminder of the importance of us being concerned about people, of caring about people, even if they're making bad choices, even if they're not doing the things that they need to do. In 1, Corinthians, 1 John chapter 4, we see that this love of God that is demonstrated by Him is also, we're, we're reminded of the importance of carrying that forward. In 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, and this is on page uh, 846 
if you're using a pew Bible. He says, in this the love of God was, love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's remarkable the more you think about it. That God could love us when we've turned our back on Him. God could love us when we deliberately do those things that he, we know He doesn't want us to do. God could love us even when we're not loving ourselves and doing what's best for ourselves. And so he also says in verse 11, Beloved, if, we, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then comes the third part of this parable. And that is the older brother. As Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. <laughs> because really that's, that's kind of where it began, was these people who were resenting the idea of sharing these blessings, the blessings of the gospel, with the people who they perceived did not deserve it. Beginning in verse 25, back to Luke chapter 15, is the description of the older brother's reaction. And the sad thing is that most of us can look at this and we kind of relate to the older brother. <laughs> We can kind of go, yeah, I kind of don't blame him. <laughs> Look at this brat who went and wasted everything, and now he wants to be come back and treated like this, and dad's doing it. Those little brothers, they always get the best stuff. I have two younger brothers, okay? And, and we can look at it and go, oh, why are they doing that for him? And then and the older brother kind of takes it that way. Beginning there in verse 25, he says, Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Stop just a second. Now notice this. He's in the field. He's working. He comes home. They're having a party. Without him. What's going on? So he says, so he called one of the servants, asking what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come. And because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. The fatted calf, the one I had planned. <laughs> I was going to use that fatted calf. I had my own party planned. And now he killed it for my brat brother? <laughs> I'm adding some, of course. Okay. <laughs> but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. <clears throat> so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. You didn't even give me a goat, much less a fatted calf. But as soon as his son of yours came, you, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now notice, this is not just an accusation against the, the little brother, is it? It's an accusation against the father. You're not being fair. You, 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 you're, you've got a great injustice here because look what I've been doing for you and you're not doing anything for me. Maybe somebody else needed to come to himself. And really that's who the audience that he's addressing <clears throat> this is the one he wants them wants to make the port the 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 point to you know th this this anger that he has about these people is just simply an extension of what had happened when this began so the father comes out and pleads with him and he says <clears throat> son you're always with me and all i have is yours I mean, what could be better than that, right? J just the first part of it. You're always with me. Thinking about that from the standpoint of God. What could we want more than to be with God? To have God in our lives. To be the one that is saying to God, I need you every hour. And recognize that. And that He's there. We, we, somebody also pointed out, if you go back to when he divided it up, 
he also divided up, it says, with them. So he gave this older brother his portion as well. Which was not uncommon, they would do this. They didn't always wait till the death of one before those things were divided up. But then he, as he says, you, what you, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother. Now you notice that. <clears throat> if you go back to verse, uh, verse 30, the older brother says, your son. It's your son who went out here and did this. The father turns it around and says, your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. It's not just the relationship with the Father, it's the relationship with each other that's, in, that's under consideration here. So, <clears throat> have we, as we think about that, and I, I'm slow on this clicker here, but you get the idea. Um, there's a number of things that we want to notice. First of all, Going back to chapter 15 and verse 1, it says that the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, near to hear him. Now, we might jokingly describe IRS agents here, you know, and say, oh, we understand that. No, it's not the same. It's not like just somebody doing a job and they're figuring numbers. In that day, the tax collectors, first of all, they were generally working for the Romans. And second of all, they were known for their corruption because basically they were given carte blanche to just say however much they wanted to keep for themselves, that's what they did, and they did. So they were known as being people taking advantage of their fellow Jews and for their own personal gain. So many of them were quite wealthy as well. And then just simply sinners. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is to recognize that these Pharisees and Sadducees that are coming to them are the ones, or Pharisees and scribes in this verse, are, are ones that Jesus often confronted and let them identify about their sin. But they, rec they saw these other people because of the nature of their things. These are sinners. These are people living this sinful lifestyle. These are people who make no qualms about it. They, we know what they're doing. We know the kind of life they're living. And they saw Jesus... Associating with them, he says, the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man, meaning Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them. And, he, and then that's when he begins these three parables. And we think about that, what he's describing for them. We certainly should want mercy, not justice from God. We depend on that for ourselves. We need to want that for others as well. Not want others to get what they deserve, but rather get what God is providing for them through Christ. And really, when we think about this idea of others getting things, doesn't mean that them getting something takes away from what we have. In fact, when we think about salvation, not only does it not take away from what God is providing for us, it is also something that enhances what we have because we can appreciate it more. I don't know about you, but I get, I get a real charge out of somebody who is just ecstatic with being saved. Ecstatic when they come up out of the water of baptism. Ecstatic when they, when they think about this wonderful salvation that is in Christ. But sometimes we get complacent about Look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard and he, was, he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing out here idle all day? And they said, Because no one hired us. And he said, You also go into the vineyard and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last of the first 
And when they came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowners, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? You take what is yours and go your way. And I wish, I, I wish to give this last man the same as, uh, as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called but few chosen. You know, this, this is one of those parables that I think some people look at and they go, Yeah, that doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair that this, these laborers who've worked all day are going to get the same wage as one who showed up for the last hour. But the fact is, it's not, none of it's fair. If it's fair, it's just, what would we receive? We would receive condemnation and eternal hell. You want fairness? Let's do it across the board. But realize, of course, that what God provided us is grace. So you find these three parables, the lost sheep, we didn't read the lost coin, but it's also in the middle here, and the lost son. And all three include something or someone that is lost. Now, the, only the third one puts it in a person, so it looks at the reaction of the person. It's not like a sheep is going to find itself and come to the conclusion it needs to be back in the herd. It's, it, it's a sheep, okay? And it's not like the coin is going to somehow miraculously find its way back to the owner. But in, when he talks about the, the prodigal son, he's looking at the change of him. But all of these include something that's lost and great effort to find. And when we think about the great effort to find the lost, Jesus said, I'm come to seek and to save that which is lost. And the effort that it took for him to do that was not only his word that was given, not only his example that was set forth, but his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to find the lost, to make provision for the lost to be found. And of course then comes the, fine, the third thing, which is that something or someone is found and followed by great rejoicing. And it's mentioned in all three parables in the first two in verses 7 and 10 that mentions the rejoicing that's going on in heaven over one who repents. So we'll end it with this. Where are you? Where are you with God? And it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. You may find people that will tell you you're fine where you're at. You may find people who don't like where you're at. What really matters is where are you with God? And is that something that you need to come to your sense about and realize really how important it is to be found in Him. And you can do that this morning. There's, there's sometimes we, we want to wait till we get everything figured out, everything worked out, everything dealt with. The man that returned to his father just simply said, I need to be back with my father. He didn't know what all was going to be involved in that. As far as he knew, he is going to be the low man on the totem pole at the bottom of the servant's ladder. But that's not where what happened. There was great rejoicing for him and there will be great rejoicing in heaven. I can tell you there'll be great rejoicing in this room. But there's even greater rejoicing in heaven. As not only God, but the angels realize what's at stake and the value of one soul. The value of your soul. There's a simple process of one responding to the gospel of Christ. You hear the gospel. You hear what he has done for you and what he's providing for you and who he is. That he's the Son of God. And that he died on the cross of Calvary to provide your salvation. That you're willing to repent of those things, whatever they may be, that'll be included in things you'll learn about as time goes on, of what is against his will, is not in accordance with his will, but your choice is to follow his will and to follow his way, denying yourself, coming to yourself and coming to him. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. As you confess your faith in Christ and willing to do so throughout your life.
And as you were baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins and raised to walk in newness of life, as we read about in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, and we're united with Him in the likeness of His death, burial, and resurrection. Maybe those are things that you've done and you've, you've made a decision to follow Christ, but you've let the world drag you back down and drag you away from God. Make the choice. Come back to Him. We'll help in any way we can. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.